great. Okay. All right. Well, it does sound like it. This does sound like it's amplifying. Yeah, it is amplifying. That's great. Never mind. Ignore everything I just said before. We're all good. Okay. Even better. You were just, you were just Normally, with the sound on. of this series, it's like gets worse as we do it. This is the first time it's gotten better when we were doing it. Uh, this is great news. Okay. So, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Joshua Tucker. I am the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia here at NYU. We apologize about the shift of venue at the last moment, but we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are interested in attending the latest in our series of conversations with Jenya Albots. I'm gonna turn it over to Jenya to introduce our guest of honor, but needless to say, we are absolutely thrilled to have Masha Gessen here today. Jenya is gonna give her introduction. We are thrilled to have uh, Jenya back again with us for the second semester of the year. We're thrilled to see so many of you here. There will be more events coming in this series, so please keep an eye on out. We have a jam-packed semester at the Jordan Center with 46 different events scheduled already at this point. Um, and faculty still bringing me more suggestions for speakers. So if you are not already on our mailing list, please go to jordanrussiacenter.org, sign up to get on the mailing list. You'll get announcements about the rest of the events in the series of conversations with Jenya Albats, as well as the rest of the programming that we have going on. Uh, as normal, normally events are over at 19 University Place on the second floor, but so happy everyone was able to make it over here to join me and to join the rest of us for what is gonna be a fascinating conversation. So thank you all. So much for being here, and I'm going to pass it over to Jenya to introduce and get us kicked off. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evgenia Alberts. Uh, I'm here, you know, uh, as you know, I'm journalist in exile, or whatever you call it. So, I, and I am absolutely thrilled, as Josh said, to welcome Masha Gesson today to this series in conversation with, uh, you know, uh, so this, you know, series of organizations that we are running in the Jordan Center since uh, September. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, I don't have really to introduce Marsha Gesson because I guess those who signed for this event, you know that Marsha Gesson is a staff writer with the New Yorker. That's the latest issue, right? The last one? Yeah. Uh, the latest one. And uh, you know that, you know, there are, hundreds of thousands of people, and if not millions, who read Marsh Gesson uh, from uh, German Chancellor um, Olaf Scholz, who acknowledged in his widely cited interview for the German weekly Der Spiegel, quote, Marsh Gesson's book, The Future's History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, uh, has shaped my conviction that Russia has been on the road to autocracy for a long time, end of quote. So it's very nice that you know some uh, that some politicians dare to read. Then you know they make you know some you know educated decisions. Not all of them you know are that good, uh, but of course, uh, for this book, uh, uh, Marsha Gesson won the 2017 National Book Award. Marsha authored 11 uh, books of nonfiction. I read, I think, uh, almost all of them, but like, uh, but I like the most three of her books. Blood matters. Yes, you know, uh, it's uh, it's you know when Marsha writes about science is as good as about politics. Then uh, another one, the man without a face, the unlikely rise of Vladimir Putin, and the future's history. To be sure, I disagreed with many of the hypotheses outlined in their books. Marsha was born in the Soviet Union, emigrated to the United States with her family in the early 80s, and returned back after the USSR collapsed. Um, uh, they worked with different Russian publications and was editing chief of three of them, correct? Snob, Gala, and uh, Vakruk Svet. Is that yes, right? That's correct. Okay, good. Yeah, I ah! have to, to count that tally. <laughs> yes, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <that. laughs> uh, and of course, you know, you know that Pakruk Sveta was, or maybe you don't, was the magazine which was patronized by Putin himself. And when Masha was fired after uh, they refused to send a reporter to cover one of Putin's PR events, uh, Putin invited uh, Masha. Uh, he wanted to uh, he wanted to convince Masha to stay as editor of Pakruk Sveta. Of course, you know she basically said, you know what she said, right? <laughs> You didn't use this term, but you know that's what the, the ship. Yeah, I, 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 I said I have to think about it. Ah, <laughs> yes, so polite. You're so well, you know, 
Anyway, Masha Gesson is a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College. Uh, they joined the Bard's faculty in 2020 and they're teaching courses through the writer's uh, written arts program, which integrates literature, art, journalism, culture, and politics. Uh, Masha Gesson is the recipient of numerous awards, including Guggenheim, Andrew Carnegie, and Neiman Fellowship, Hitchens Prize, Overseas Press Club Award for Best Commentary and an honorary uh, doctorate from the Craig Newman Graduate School of Journalism in the City University of New York. So I, I try to do my best, you know, even though, you know, of course, you know, we can continue uh, talking about Marsha herself, but, you know, please welcome Marsha Gesson to, uh, to this event. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that incredibly well researched introduction. <laughs> Marsha. So back in November 2022, Masha Gessen wrote a piece at the New Yorker titled Why Vladimir Putin Would Use Nuclear Weapons in Ukraine. I mean, promising, of course, you know, extremely optimistic, as we love it. So I read the article, fully disagreed with it, and that I immediately called Masha and said, Masha, let's do an interview. And so here we are. Masha, you, you, do you still believe that uh, Putin is going to use nuclear weapons? Well, I never said he's going to use nuclear weapons. What I said was that he could. Okay. Right? And I mean, the purpose of this column was to, um, I think there's something that happens when we talk about things that defy belief. Right, which which is a lot of our reality for the last few years, um, which is there's um, there's a failure of theory of mind, right? And what I realized I was observing a lot in the fall was that very smart people who are very good at analyzing large amounts of information were looking at this particular question of you know uh, is Putin's saber rattling, nuclear saber rattling, completely empty or is there substance to it? And as they examined it, I felt like they kept failing the theory of mind test, right? So they were explaining why they, in their um, universe, uh, acting rationally as they understand rational acting, would not use nuclear weapons. But I found very few of those arguments, not, you know, not all of them, but I uh, uh, were, failed that theory of mind test. But I felt I felt that most of them failed the theory of mind test. Right? So that's you know what I set out to to do in that column was sort of run run through the arguments, and argue from Putin's point of view, you know what actually what actually is a deterrent and what is it. So you know I I do believe that the majority of you do read New Yorker as religiously as I do. Mm -hmm. uh, still, you know, Masha, would you please to uh, summarize uh, your argument? Um, sure. So, I mean, my main argument is that um, for, uh, I mean, for the last few years, but particularly since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, there mm -hmm. has been this, uh, uh, this trope that seems to, uh, to be helpful in understanding what's going on, which is, you know, Putin is crazy. Uh, he is not acting rationally. What I'm arguing is that it's much more useful to ask the question, this doesn't just concern Putin, in general, when somebody is not acting rationally in our understanding, it is much more useful to ask this, the question, what is the world in which this behavior is rational, right? And, uh, and so, you know, I try to describe that world. Uh, it has been a couple of months since I wrote that column. So uh, if I forget something, I you can remind it, yeah. Um, but um, um, but uh, Putin's world, as he has described it to us, and I again, you know, I, I'm not claiming to be inside his head. I'm just saying, let's listen to what the man says and then try to understand the contours of his world in his own words, right? In his own words, um, Putin, uh, I'm sorry, could you stop recording, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, in his own words, he is, um, he sees Russia as surrounded by enemies. He sees Russia fighting a sacred world, uh, war against a hostile Western world on the one hand. On the other hand, um, 
he sees at least potentially himself as the leader of the larger part of the world, right? Or a leader of the larger part of the world. Russia is the, uh, you know, he imagines that there's a sort of traditional value civilization, whatever that means. Uh, but that traditional value civilization may include China, it may, it may uh, include Muslim countries, um, it may include all of Africa. And only Russia of all these countries has the courage of its convictions to fight against the hegemony of the West to protect this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the traditional value civilization, right? So this is important. The war is sacred and he represents the larger part of the world, right? So the, the arguments, uh, some of the arguments that were used um, to, uh, to say that, you know, Putin is not going to use nuclear weapons under any circumstances. And again, I'm not arguing that he's going to use nuclear weapons. What I'm saying is that it's not impossible and that the, Argument, most of the arguments that we have relied on to say this is completely impossible are flawed. Not necessarily wrong, but flawed, right? And this is the, uh, the, uh, the flaw that I see here is uh, one of the arguments is um, he will alienate his powerful allies uh, or his fence sitting allies such as China if he uses nuclear weapons. I can see a situation in which, and you know, and and he has demonstrated that he is very close to this place where he convinces himself that he will not alienate them. In fact, that he will prove his worthiness as an ally because he will do something so heroic um, to pr protect uh, protect the traditional value civilization. That's number one. Another argument that has been used is that. Russia's nuclear weapons are, you know, they need to be transported to the Ukrainian border. Ukraine has proven very effective at deploying its um, air defense systems and including deploying its air defense systems on Russian territory. So Russia couldn't be, uh, Putin couldn't be sure that the nuclear weapon would not detonate on Russian or, uh, territory or affect Russian territory. The simple answer to that, this is a much simpler argument to, to engage with, he doesn't care, right? This we have seen ample evidence of, right? Um, sending hundreds of, uh, hundreds of thousands of bodies to the front as cannon fodder demonstrates very clearly he doesn't care. A third argument that has been used is that if Putin uses a nuclear weapon or a nuclear-ish weapon um, that will provoke full engagement with NATO but he thinks he is at war with NATO, right? So I'm not debunking all the arguments. I think there's one argument that actually has a lot of validity, right? And that is um, the, uh, oh, then there's the fourth argument, which is the economic sanctions will be so devastating. Just finally, so, so, so completely, totally devastating that everything will change, right? That's just a crazy person's argument because we know that economic sanctions, you know, that's like, I mean, crazy persons in the sense of trying the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We know what economic sanctions do. Uh, they basically, they affect ordinary Russians horribly. They do not uh, uh, affect the elites in any meaningful way. And they foster this feeling of Russia against the world. And if anything, they possibly help to mobilize the population. Right. Um, and then the final argument that I think actually has a lot of validity is that Putin has been directly threatened with specific retaliatory moves, such as uh, you know that NATO will annihilate the Black Sea Fleet if he uses a nuclear nuclear-ish weapon, and that I think has validity. Right? That's that's actually a meaningful statement in the world that Putin inhabits. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Uh, however, it's not just about NATO. It's about that. You know, there is just, you know, the uh, Random House just came out, you know, with the, with its latest report, the war in the war, a long war. And they also write about the fact that the United States are going to get, in, that one of the reasons why Putin is not going to use nuclear weapons, precisely because he, he was told by numerous of uh, United States officials that the United States are going to use nuclear weapons against him. And he knows that they know where he has his, you know, safe houses. They know that, you know, there is some place 41 uh, kilometers, about 60 miles southeast of Moscow. 
uh, that can be reached by the uh, uh, by the U.S. Uh, missiles, and you will, he will be just there. What's the point of using nuclear weapons if it ends up with his death? Um, I imagine that Putin, who has uh, invested heavily, and we used to think insanely, right, in, in building endless bunkers, um, a, including, you know, a, what was it, a 15 year construction project on the Black Sea. Uh, and, you know, I, um, I initially, yeah, I'm in the palace. Okay, the right? palace, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the palace, I think it, it actually tells us a lot about this universe in which he lives. Uh, because I used to, I spent a lot of time thinking about the palace. I first wrote about the palace uh, in, in in my book, the Man, the Man Without a Face, right? And I was trying to figure out what um, what the thinking was. I thought, you know, what like why would somebody uh, and the, and there was an elaborate scheme, quaint by today's standards, but you know, it seemed really uh, huge at the time. You know, uh, like using. Um, uh, fake charity organizations and fake charity donations to siphon off money, you know, a little bit, I mean, we're talking millions, but small millions at a time to keep this incredibly, uh, to keep building this incredibly lavish palace on the, on the Black Sea. And I wondered, you know, what is he thinking? Is he thinking he's going to retire there? Because, um, I mean, he obviously wasn't going to use it as an official residence because this was a secret project. Right. So um, was he going to retire then? And I thought, you know, oh, he's crazy. Right. He has like no planning horizon. And so so he just wants this thing, this toy that's almost an abstraction far away to know that he has. it. Um, and then, um, as most of you probably know, uh, after Alexei Navalny was uh, jailed two years ago, he released his absolute blockbuster so his people released his you know, ultimate investigation, which is Putin's palace, which has at, the, at this point been seen by every adult human in, in, in Russia. 18 uh, million people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and um, most, most of them in, in, uh, living in the Russian Federation, uh, at least at the time. And um, what, you know, it, 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 a lot of it is ridiculous. It's 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 this it's this lavish palace, or what it, you know somebody like Putin's imagine Putin imagines a palace to be. But what's remarkable about it is that a lot of it is underground. Um, it's and that you know that's that that's a really sinister reminder to heed my own advice, which is you know do not assume he is crazy, but try to figure out what is this world in which in which this behavior is rational. So what is the world in which it is rational to devote um, extreme effort and money to building an underground palace, basically a lux luxury nuclear bunker. That world is a world that, uh, that uh, you know that, that goes through nuclear war. Um, is he afraid that that uh, protection is insufficient? Probably. Is he afraid enough? considering that he has spent so much time um, and poured such vast resources into protecting himself for this exact eventuality, you know, into protecting himself from actual nuclear weapons directed at Russia. You know, is he going to be afraid enough to not use them? I think that's, that's an open question. Let's start from the beginning. Okay. What was the whole purpose of his invasion of Ukraine. What was the purpose of this war? What do you think? I think that he was, uh, at least, you know, what when, when I was still in Moscow and I was talking to people who met with him a week prior to the war. The last one I spoke to, he met with Putin on February 17th and the war started on February 21st. So the idea was that Putin was uh, good. Putin had a, an option to occupy uh, Ukraine and to go get into wholesale war with Ukraine back in 2014. He didn't because, according to the source, 
uh, he decided that he got, you know, this amazing, you know, pop up of his ratings after an extension of Crimea, when uh, approximately 88% of those questions said that, you know, they were in favor of an extension of Crimea and that, you know, his rating went up and it was, it was a huge success, PR success for Putin. So he decided why to have all at once. He was looking for, he's looking for re-election in 2024. He understands that, you know, each time there was the same dynamics, you know, his ratings went up and he did something, then, you know, it was significantly down, corruption, blah, blah, blah. As it happened in 2013, his rating was below 50%. He knew that he was losing, uh, you know, at least, you know, because he's an autocrat, he needs to, uh, to see this uh, popular support. So, and that's why he decided to delay this uh, invasion of Ukraine. That's, ex that's one of the hypotheses why he did. Of course, you know, we can say reinstating Russian empire, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he came up with this article that where, uh, in the course of with each, you know, he, Ukrainians there, you know, uh, lesser Russians and all this kind of stuff. So what, what is your thing? Um, I think both of the uh, of these things are true. I think there's the um, the sort of the very pedestrian uh, raising his uh, boosting his popularity, right? And let's just like pause for a second on this whole issue of, of uh, re-election because you know that almost makes it sound like he would actually count the votes and uh, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> right? Yeah, let's just like uh, pause on that. I mean. Somebody like Putin, uh, in order to um, to complete a re-election operation, actually needs a lot more than fifty percent of the vote. Right? That's the paradox of of, of, of having an autocracy, is that um, an autocrat has to continuously demonstrate overwhelming support, right? Uh, and uh, including overwhelming support among anybody who might be uh, wield guns. Right, so he has to constantly demonstrate overwhelming support of the armed forces, the police, uh, you know, the security services, uh, his personal army that he has created, and so he actually needs numbers, you know, not just for his personal vanity. He needs numbers that are much higher than than fifty percent, right, in order to complete this thing that's a fake election, right, and that's um, it's it's a ridiculous but 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 you know readily observable logic. So I think yes, I think he um, he did have the illusion that he would be able to occupy Ukraine very quickly and repeat the incredible success of uh, occupying Crimea, right? Um, in his mind, the that whole operation was a net positive all around, right? Including economic sanctions. Western sanctions were great. They actually did, uh, you know, I, I was among those who scoffed at this idea back in 2014, but they did boost domestic production. And, um, and they did, uh, you know, they, they, they did mobilize the population. They helped create the sense that, you know, it, um, people have to sacrifice, but in exchange, they get to belong to this great country. Uh, that's that's done something really terrific, which is reclaim Crimea, which was unjustly uh, given to Ukraine. Um, so, I think there was there there was a kind of calculus that um, that this was all going to work out exactly the same way. He knew how this goes. Um, but I also think that it would be unwise to write off his grand statements. And say, oh, those are just for public consumption. Nothing works like that. Like hum humans don't actually work like that. If you repeat something over and over again, if you perseverate um, on an idea, even if that idea was not something you initially believed, uh, and you know, I don't suspect the audience of engaging in this kind of behavior, but think back to when you were a teenager and you would like tell your parents that you hadn't done something, you hadn't taken something, and they didn't believe you, and you would get incredibly insulted. And then you would like repeat it several times over. And by the time the fight was over, you knew you were right, right? And, um, and I think it's, it's the same sort of thing. You know, um, uh, a man does not publish that article. He does not position himself as uh, sort of the ultimate authority on Russian history as he has now for a number of years. Um, he does not propose certain ideas about 
Russian history and his personal role in it, which is very definitely you know, restoring the empire without coming to believe it. And so I think there was, uh, for some of his personal consumption, some of his AIDS consumption, there was a sort of rational argument of, um, rational in that sense argument of, um, you know, we can, just, we can just do this cheaply, quickly, popularly with no losses. But there's also uh, you know, vastly documented, right? Uh, demonstrated personally by Putin repeatedly, idea that he is the leader of this traditional value civilization. He is the gatherer of Russian lands. He is going to restore historical justice. And he has to do it because no one else can. Okay. So, so if still, you know, I mean, he obviously, you know, when he started this war and even now, you know, he's looking into, you know, some eternity, yeah. right? To, to, to at least 2024. So what's the point of uh, turning everything into the nuclear waste? If you think about, you know, uh, staying in power uh, uh, through 2024. Um, well, what other options does he have? I mean, this is this this is the this image has been beaten to death, uh, including by Putin himself. But um, but you know the cornered rat uh, problem is is right there, um, and and here you give me a chance to quote another politician quoting me. Well, this is a much more meaningful quote for me uh, than Olaf Schulz. But Zhozana Kaputova, who is the president of um, Slovakia, was speaking in the Ukrainian parliament in uh in june or may or june of last year uh and she was referring to uh some western politicians suggestions that putin should be given an opportunity to save face and she said well read masha gesson's book he doesn't have a face uh so <laughs> um but the thing is what other options does he have and this is the scariest part of the of thinking through the situation um what happens if he doesn't um, persist? And what happens if he doesn't succeed in this war? What happens to him? Yeah, that's, that's a valid argument that he doesn't have an option not to deliver. Right. Right. Uh, it's true, but it's also true that unlike uh, kids tend to think, it's not just about Putin Putin pushing the button. It's a process, it's a procedure, right? Uh, many people are involved in uh, getting nuclear weapons up, right? right? Or down or whatever. Uh, so uh, he should believe that people who report to him will fulfill this order. And I think he knows his guys around him better than we do. And he does know that they are corrupted bastards, that they uh, love to make money inside Russia, but they prefer to live on French Riviera and uh, entertain their girls or boys or whoever uh, somewhere you know, in the nicer part of Europe, nicer than Russia. And so, so and he cannot be aware that if he gives an order, push the button, this order is going to be fulfilled. And he can't allow for him to, for such kind of orders. Um, I think that's a great point. Uh, and I think that one of the things that that means is that he's definitely not going to, well, I'm not going to say definitely. I don't think he's going to use nuclear weapons in the immediate future, right? Um, the sense of isolation, the sense of you know, no other option has to become more profound, both for him and for the people around him. Um, if the war keeps going the way it's going, and there's no reason to think it's not, um, you know, that, that sense will only intensify. M more people who are close and close-ish to Putin are going to become per international pariahs. They're going to be sanctioned. They're going to have their assets seized. They're going to realize that they will not be able to leave the country ever. Uh, and if uh, Russia loses the war, they will be prosecuted for war crimes. Um, they're, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to be tied to him by 
a series of crimes. This is a logic that he understands very, very well, both sort of um, in experience and I think instinctively, right? The logic of, um, um, of, of, of being forever bound to each other by crime. Um, I also, you know, if you think about the history of Putinism, it's really long, right? And it has these long periods of stagnation, right? Brief periods of sort of accelerating crackdown um, when the political situation and the nature of the regime changes in key ways. And then long periods of just the same thing uh, over and over again. And I think that we may be entering one of those periods with the war, right? Um, but, and then there's going to be a moment of acceleration. So that's, you know, I think that, I think there's a, this is a slowdown and it doesn't mean that he's not going to, to use nuclear weapons. Um, and one final point, or two final points. Um, I don't know that I am quite as convinced as you are that, um, that, that he is aware of how unreliable his people are just because they are compelled to demonstrate their loyalty constantly. Um, and the second point is that um, I don't know that dropping a dirty bomb, right, which is why I refer to nuclear-ish weapon, requires the same kind of cooperation. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that's not something that can be done um, outside the regular channels of command. Please, you know, I don't know, you know, I, we, I don't, we, yeah, I don't we, we need, you know, maybe, you know, there are somebody on Zoom who knows <laughs> this better than, uh, you know, who can, you know, sort of explain to us the way this system works. Right. But, you know, what I know for sure that with respect to the nuclear weapons, it's a procedure. You cannot do it. Quickly. Right, right. Now, uh, another argument that really doesn't allow for using of any news. All of us, we see time and again, Putin meeting with different people. Now, anyone who is going to meet with Putin has to be in, uh, under quarantine for two weeks. Even, you know, his closest advisors, his, the majority of his closest advisors, they don't live at home, they live, you know, in the specific places so they wouldn't interact with others so not to bring any infection to the divine uh, Tsar. Now, uh, we see that just lately, he met with two Hasidim uh, rabbis, Baradai and Razar, and of course, they spent previous couple of weeks, you know, sitting in current, still, he was probably five meters away from them. With Macron, this is beautiful white table, and you know Macron is somewhere there. <laughs> you know, Masha, guy wants to live. Guy right. is afraid to get infected. Probably he's immune compromised because of his. Uh, you know, people say that he has. You know, uh, this comes. You know, doesn't matter. He's obviously he's immune compromised. He's afraid to get caught. Mm -hmm. How does it go along with uh, with, uh, with 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 using nuclear? Uh, what? I'm going to say the same thing again, right? Um, what are his other options? Right? His, he wants to live. And that works both ways, right? If he, um, if he is facing the possibility of military defeat, if he is facing the possibility of not being able to do this re-election thing, Right. What happens? Because that is facing death in his mind. Right. I'm not so sure because, you know, yes, I think that, you know, you know, from my point of view, there should be somebody who is going to slit his throat. But I just uh, think so that <laughs> but. Uh, but, you know, I don't think that he believes in that because, you know, he surrounded himself with extremely loyal personalities. Basically, you know, you wrote this in your book. He surrounded himself with his lieutenants, you know, who, and he, every so often he rotates them. He, say, he appoints them as governors so that he can bring new ones who will be, you know, these are very, you know, very intimate relationship that he has mm -hmm. with his uh, lieutenants. 
So he doesn't believe that it's possible to approach him. I think uh, that he, you know, he should believe in in uh, that he's pretty much secure. Wait, you, you think he believes that he is secure in that, case, you know, somebody, you in know, case of military that, defeat? Yeah, that, you know, no, in, that, you know, that somebody who is going to assassinate, that uh, assassin mm -hmm. won't be able to reach. Right, right. I don't know. I don't think he, he thinks he's going to, I mean, I, I think he is paranoid enough about assassination that he, it's unlikely that an assassination attempt, attempt could be successful, right? Um, but what is his sense of his own future if he is staring down the possibility of military defeat? Like, what does that feel like if it doesn't feel like death? In fact, you think about that. He controls the narrative, Masha. You and I and everybody else in the world may know mm -hmm. that he lost. But inside Russia, given that he controls the narrative, given that uh, you know, these propaganda channels 24 seven, an extremely effective propaganda channel, given that, you know, those people who do have a, you know, uh, a custom to go on the, on the web and get information there, they uh, live in Russia en masse, right? He can put, present any defeat as a success story because right. he controls the narrative. Right, exactly, uh, except, I think, and this, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I think that propaganda bubble bursts the moment Ukrainians start liberating Crimea. I don't think he can keep that um, you know, off television um, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, uh, probably the lesser reason is the, you know, just the information will flow. And the bigger reason is that, um, I think will feel like personal defeat to a lot of his own propagandists, right? We we saw intimations of that when Ukraine started its counteroffensive, right? There was a lot of sort of rumbling, and um, and the first notes of criticism of the war efforts started to sound on official TV, but I think you know that doesn't even start to compare to what will happen if Ukraine liberates Crimea. What do you think? I think that it's not going to go that far. Mm -hmm. I think that Ukraine, Zelensky is a smart guy and he does understand that uh, liberation of Crimea is a, is a long shot. I think that uh, Russians will go for negotiations uh, when they realize that they are unable to take over Donbass. So far we know that Putin controls only 59%, maybe you know, with taking you know, some you know, these villages around Bakhmut maybe a little bit over 60% of that, but that's it. So I think that, I think, and that's what, you know, I, when I talk to different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, military experts inside the country, they think that he will go to, to, uh, to uh, that the, the, the upcoming offense will be uh, in Donbass, but he will try to, uh, get control over the entire territory of Donbass, and that's it. And that's when Russians will go from the cage. They don't have armory. They don't have ammunition. Yes, there are a lot of Soviet-made weapons, uh, but you know, it's very difficult uh, to fight this modern war uh, with uh, Kalashnikov. To cut a long story short, I think that Crimea, liberation of Crimea is a very long shot, that the war will be over before that. And Crimea will be put like, you know, we're going to negotiate this in a period of five, 10 years, something like that. Um, so I have a, a question for you about that and, and then a point to make. So the, my question is, what is the story that Channel One tells people when that happens? Like, um, how do they spin Russia pulling out of all of Ukraine except Crimea? You know that we defended our Russia, we defended uh, our fellow Russians in Donbass. You know, it was a great success. Finally, we managed to bring our people back to Russia. That's exactly what that right, right. Say. And and Ukraine will never Listen, join. Uh, Ukraine said. will never join NATO. Our our borders Russia, are secure. Ukraine right. will never join NATO. Right. You and I, we know that it's not going to happen in our lifetime. But right. NATO keep going to say yes, yes, yes. 
But you know, let's do it, you know. Not oh, yeah, yeah no, but I'm talking about what Channel One will say, right? Channel One will say we have secured the of guarantee course. that Ukraine of will course. never join NATO, so our border and is secure. Maybe. Fellow Russians. Maybe. Um, but my second, my point is that, you know, Zelensky, unlike Putin, is a democratically elected politician. And he is dealing with a public that understands what happens to people under Russian occupation. And Crimea is not an exception in, you know, in the, in the view of, of, of um, Ukrainian public opinion, right? Uh, it's not an exception from political prosecution, from raping and pillaging, from misery, from violence, right? How does Zelensky sell that kind of negotiation to his people? I, I really actually don't see how that's possible. I think that Zelensky you know, will sell this negotiation by saying that we won this battle. Uh, we managed to secure the major part of Ukraine uh, that, uh, but we have to, you know, we have to think about it. 200, more than 200,000 Ukrainians dead, at those who were fighting, right? You know, 8.5 million Ukrainians are in exile, 2.5 million uh, Ukrainians in, uh, in a, uh, internally displaced. Uh, internally displaced. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's a disaster for this 44, 41 million strong nation. So he will say that, you know, we won this war, but now, you know, let's, finish, you know, this through negotiation because we need to save our people and etc. Maybe, maybe. Okay. I hope so. Besides, you know, I do think that, you know, as we're well aware, the outcomes of wars is that, you know, after uh, authoritarian leaders are taking over, as it happened after the World right. War II, military and generals took over in the majority of countries, starting with the United States and ending up with the Golden Fronts. So I don't think that Zelensky has that many chances to survive after right. But, you know, that's another story. Anyway, so, uh, okay. Uh, now uh, there is a um, question. So now we're going to alternate questions between uh, those who come uh, via Zoom, because, you know, we have, you know, uh, hundreds of people who are watching us on Zoom. Vincent, Putin was quoted this morning as saying that Russia is once again Surrounded by Russian tanks, specifically Leopard tanks by Russian tanks. Amer American tanks. Ah, maybe. It's right. And now what has to be done by using all weapons okay. in its arsenal to defend itself? You already spoke of the nuclear issue, but what about the World War II mindset? When will this change? Ever? Never. <laughs> Certainly but not. Um, no, I mean, the World War II mindset is not just a mindset. It's... Um, it's the central mythology of contemporary Russian society. So until there's another myth, until there's a whole other story of whatever you know is there in that part of the world after the war, it will continue. Everything will continue to be a reference to World War II or the Great Patriotic War. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, meanwhile, Elizabeth, you brought up the failure of fear of mind, Solzhenitsyn in the 1980s talks about, uh, Solzhenitsyn in the 1980s talks about why Americans have such a fundamental misunderstanding of Russia. Has nothing changed? Do you ultimately think that the West has the capacity, boy, has the capacity, has the capacity to understand Putin's way of thinking, Russia's way of thinking? I mean, those are very general terms, and I don't want to say them, you know, that there's some, something essential about the West that misunderstands something essential about Russia. I think that when we confront the, I mean, I'll give you a completely different example, right? Um, I was, um, when Donald Trump had locked in the Republican primary, I spoke to any number of people who said he's not going to be the candidate. And these, include, these were Republicans, including Republican uh, political operatives and Democrats. And when I pressed and, you know, and asked them, like, why? What, how is it not going to happen? He's locked in the nomination. This was like in March or April of um, uh, 2016. They would essentially say, because I can't believe it, because it's unimaginable, right? Um, it's human nature 
to resist the unimaginable. Um, there's, um, it probably serves some kind of protective function. I mean, maybe if we don't resist the unimaginable, then we start, you know, sitting uh, across a 10 yard table from one another and, uh, and demanding that our, all, everyone we socialize with quarantine for, for two weeks, right? Um, there's, there's a way in which we sort of manage risk in the imagination that, um, that leads to its failure, the failure of the imagination. Okay. Uh, do we have questions? Kyle, thank you so much for doing this. Speaking of Donald Trump, the MAGA Republican, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and her ilk have made quite, Kevin McCarthy, have made quite clear that, quote, the era of the blank check for Ukraine is over. And many of the MAGA Republicans are openly uh, Putinophilic, shall we say. Um, and I mean, look at Nick Fuentes who met with Trump. And what I'm trying to say, is it not possible that Putin is just thinking maybe we can hang on till let's say October if we're more or less in a war of attrition and there's no more aid coming from Washington. Is he aware of the MAGA Republican stance oh, yeah, on Ukraine? So. Yeah, is that maybe his strategy? Because that might be in a cynical and cruel way, rational. Oh, definitely. I mean, and again, you, we don't we don't have to theorize about it, right? It's 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 quite out in the open. The idea that uh, you know that after the midterms, Congress was no longer going to keep rubber stamping aid to Ukraine. Uh, the idea that Europeans were going to the European consensus was going to shatter following a cold winter in Europe, um, poor Europe deprived of Russian oil and gas, not. Um, unfortunately, uh, and um, uh, you know, so there's uh, we hear that a lot actually from 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 the propaganda machine. It is it is a central tenet of uh, you know Russia is a big country with a lot of bodies to sacrifice, um, and the West uh, just doesn't have the you know the strength of its convictions uh, to put up with expensive gasoline and um, and cold apartments. Not an entirely unfounded idea, right? Um, so I think where it breaks down is that the idea that Russia will win a war of attrition is problematic, right? Um, both sides can get really bogged down in a war of attrition. But in, you know, if he, in his imagination, um, he conquers all of Ukraine and, and, and manages to dominate it, you know, I don't think that that's actually uh, the history of, 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 of Russian wars shows us that that's not exactly how it works. Andrei Gulnev, uh, based on your expert knowledge of the Russian regime, and given that wars have, uh, have had diverse effect on autocracy, how would you assess the effect of the current Ukrainian war on the Russian regime with its strengthening or shaken totalitarianism inside the country? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand that uh, wars have an adverse war effect on autocracies. Uh, he says diverse. I'm oh, sorry. diverse, diverse. Oh, no, sorry. that's what you said. I, 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 uh, um, I mean, so far, I think we are not seeing the war weakening the regime in any way. The problem with the, with totalitarian regimes is that you know that they failed after it's happened. Right? It doesn't. You know, it's not like we see. Um, we see a lot of preparation and, you know, the, the, the I mean, I, I realize that there might be some people here who remember the science of uh, watching, you know, who stands where in the mausoleum and, 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 and reading the tea leaves that way. And yet none of them could, could have predicted what happened in the late 1980s, early 90s. Um, so the answer is actually, we don't know, but from what we can tell about Russian society, which is more than we can tell about the regime, the society has actually cohered more as a result of war and hardship um, and increasing poverty, uh, which is not surprising. Hardship is great for totalitarians. Yeah. Uh, could you discuss uh, Maria uh, claim, I think. Uh, uh, could you discuss like the oh. scenario for post-Putin Russian political transition and what kind of engagement uh, by international community would be constructive to stabilize the regime? So I have a very short answer and I hope you have a longer answer. Uh, 
my short answer is that um, if we've learned anything from history is that this is another point where the imagination tends to, to fail us, right? Uh, uh, it, two key points in the 20th century when Stalin died and then when the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States foreign policy establishment uh, could not imagine the incredible array of political opportunities that were opening up. And in both cases, basically uh, had a very strong bias toward actually propping up the evil they knew against an imaginary evil they didn't know. Um, if anything, that's, you know, that's the lesson that we have to draw from it. And there's a terrific short book by Joshua Rubenstein called uh, Last Days of Stalin. I now always have to pause after the, after the movie Death of Stalin, which actually is also a very accurate portrayal of that exact thing. Uh, you know, the, um, but it's, it's Last Days of Stalin and it's, uh, it's, it's a great look at uh, US State Department documents uh, and, you know, and you read these memos to Eisenhower saying, if Stalin dies, the hardliners might take over, uh, and, you know, and the mind boggles. Um, but also you realize that, uh, that the Soviet Union was, was uh, ready to pull out of, the, uh, of Korea, and the United States missed the message, just like did not read those signals because it was unbelievable that that could happen, right? So, um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not predicting that it will be great or even good or even decent uh, after Putin, but I am predicting that there will be vast opportunities. Hey. What do you think? You know, uh, I think that, you know, uh, I really think that it will go worse before it will go better, but mm -hmm. you know, the, whoever's coming after Putin will be lacking any legitimacy. Right. And so we know through, from, you know, other regimes like that, that, you know, they basically shut the regime. Yes, please. Hello, and thank you for this wonderful conversation. My question comes to you from my colleagues who are in Lviv, Kiev, and Dnipro. They ask me every week, every month, you know, if the Russians really don't hate us, why aren't they out in the streets? Why aren't they day after day fighting for us? Uh, my colleagues cannot leave. They're all men under the age of 60. Um, they've all, you know, tried to get their wives and children over the border and they all ended up coming back. That's part one. And part two is around the Iran-Russia connection. Has there been any changes because of the protests in Iran? And yes, thank you. Um, I don't know that I have an answer on Iran, but maybe you do. Um, uh, and I, you know, I'd love to hear what you think about why, if Russians don't really hate us. Um, I think the sad fact of the matter is that most Russians do not oppose the war. Um, very few Russians who remain in the country oppose the war. Now, I, um, you know, I think we can parse out some of the reasons for that, and a lot of it has to do with, with the power of propaganda, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the fear inherent in living in totalitarian society, um, and the sense of powerlessness inherent in feeling in totalitarian, living in totalitarian society, and, and actually the impossibility of even forming your own opinions in a totalitarian society. Um, but you know, I don't think we can be. I mean, I, I can't. You know, I can't be addressing by proxy people who are in Ukraine and saying, have some sympathy for these people living in a totalitarian regime, right? Uh, the fact is that most Russians do not oppose the war. Um, some you know, thousands of incredibly brave people have and continue to risk everything to protest this war, but that's a drop in the 140 million bucket. Uh, first of all, you know, I should say that, you know, I feel uh, as I always, whenever I see anyone from Ukraine, I should say that I'm ashamed of what my country is doing. And I'm sorry for that. And I feel responsible for what is what my country is doing in Ukraine. I'm citizen of Russian Federation. And I do think that they, those who do this, they will pay directly, but you know, it will take time to do this. Now, why Russians didn't exist? At the very beginning, you know, when the war started, I was in Moscow. I was in Moscow till August 23rd, uh, 2022. 
And, uh, you know, there were, you know, people, you know, instinctively went out on the streets. There were all kinds of anti-war protests and thousands of people were arrested, you know, uh, according to the uh, human rights group over the enforce, some uh, 16,000 people were arrested, put for a different uh, uh, amount of time in jails, fined, and et cetera, et cetera. Many of us were fined pronounced foreign agents. I left after, you know, I was fined. I was uh, found guilty on four charges of uh, uh, spreading disinformation about over the Russian army and fined at the amount of approximately $14,000. Uh, and then after that, I was pronounced a foreign agent. And so the next step for me was probably to go to jail, which uh, we decided with my friends that it was a Russian. I do agree with Masha that a lot of young Russians turned out to be cowards. They turned out, you know, they lived under this uh, uh, immense prosperity that Russia never seen before. And it's true that in 2010, 2013, uh, Russians lived better than any time in their entire history due to the oil prices, market economy, and all the gains that happened, you know, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, uh, those who were capable to resist, they chose to leave. And we saw this run in February, March, you know, when everyone, whoever was capable to leave, they left. And that was a sign because then afterwards I started driving around Russia and talking to people because there was no information, everything was closed. And I kept asking people and they said, you know, wait a second, you know, all, you know, people, you know, with visibility all of them the left, you know, why do you expect us to go out on the streets and uh, risk the left? So it's also true that uh, unfortunately the 30 years of uh, post-communist uh, development didn't produce civil society didn't produce citizens, but you know, it's, this is the country of cowards. However, I disagree with Russia that lots of Russians do support the war. There are people, of course, who do support the war. The majority of them, they're in their, their retirement age. However, people in their 30s and 40s at large, they choose to leave the country. About 2 million people already left the country. I, for the record, I didn't say most people support the war. I said most people don't oppose the war. Yeah, and I think that's oh, that's that's, that's a significant better. difference. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Okay, Adam Magana. I think I heard in other interviews that Marsh that Marsha is writing a book where part of the goal is giving hope to young people about the world. Is a young person struggling to find hope in the context of Western politics? Can we get a sneak peek at some of the ways of helping young people hope <laughs> for a better future, please? That is adorable. Um, so yeah, it's been tough going because uh, the book was um, about a third written and then and then the full scale invasion began. And it kind of felt like I had to rewrite it, but I also haven't had time to work on it. Uh, so young person, it's, uh, uh, I'm gonna finish it by the end of this year and then it will come out next year. Uh, but the book is really about uh, small political projects, uh, and it's uh, it, it's based the, sort of the theory of it is based on the concept of the parallel polis, which actually dates back to um, Czech and in some ways Polish dissidents in the 1970s, and um, and the idea is that when you cannot influence the regime, you can build a working model of the future in the present. Um, and that is meaningful political action. Um, and the book is going to be called, this is a quote from um, Eric Fromm, The Certainty of the Reality of the Possibility, which I think neatly sums up the nature of hope. Uh, Julie, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. I wanted to come back to the issue of nuclear weapons if, uh, if with which we started. And in a way, it went away by this uh, the, by this uh, kind of provision that it's uh, they are not uh, ex they are, you don't expect that uh, it's it is such a catastrophe will happen soon 
but uh, why don't we face it at the unthinkable? What if uh, such a thing happened? In what situation, what, what, what would that create it? How do you imagine? I mean, this is something that was in the title of, the, of, uh, of your uh, discussion. And I think this is uh, something that needs to be faced. Um, hi, Arana. Uh, I, um, I mean, you know, I, as a journalist, I try to always maintain my position as an observer and not a predictor of the future. Uh, but what I think we have observed is that, you know, I think, I think Zhenya, and I, you know, I'd love to hear you talk, talk about this if you will entertain this idea for, for a minute. But I think you know Zhenya uh, Stake seems to be thank you very much. Um, the use of nuclear weapons leads to sort of the nuclear apocalypse, um, which I think is the way that we imagined uh, nuclear weapons in the, uh, when we were growing up. Right. Um, I imagine. The apocalypse coming slowly at a, a you know sort of creeping toward the the apocalypse. Um, I imagine uh, something that, at least in Putin's imagination, provides the possibility of plausible deniability. So probably dirty bomb, uh, or you know, an explosion staged at one of the sites of the. Uh, nuclear um, facilities that uh, you know, in Zaporozhye or um, um, or elsewhere that you know that clearly they're obsessed with, right? uh, and and then the West probably dithering in its response uh, that you know that I think is a is a huge risk, and um, you know and then and then it sort of escalating catastrophically, but but slowly in a way, or at least slowly compared to what we imagine happens when we, when, when we say the word nuclear weapons. Yes, please. my turn. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. um, it was interesting to hear you describe Putin as a man of conviction and his convictions are not convictions that we share, right. but I wonder if it's possible that he is just a cynic. He's using the slogans of xenophobia and external enemy to cling to power and to everything he has stolen. Um, I think it's both. I mean, I think uh, I mean, the, the, uh, and it's and it's hard to separate one from the other because Putin, the Putin ideology is deeply cynical, right? It's an ideology based on the idea of a corrupt world, um, uh, based on the idea of everyone having only their sort of uh, personal financial interests, um, but. I want to caution against sort of reducing it to um, to just cyn the cynical use of slogans because I think um, I, I think it's I think it's a mistake and it's a mistake that we make over and over again, right? Uh, I mean, there's a famous New York Times article from 1940, uh, 1930s um, about how no 1930s um, about how Hitler is using all these xenophobic slogans. Just to buy popularity, he doesn't mean any of this, right? Um, it's actually a, a trope that we apply to uh, uh, to ideologically driven autocrats pretty consistently, right? And and I understand why because we do see them instrumentalizing ideology, and so it's really tempting to say, oh, you know, that's uh, this is not an ideologically driven person. This is a person. Who weaponizes and uh, instrumentalizes ideology? I don't know that there's a meaningful difference, and I also think that uh, that it's it's possible to weave sort of in and out of both modalities. Uh, Julia Bikova, uh, Bikova, I'm sorry, Julia Bikova. Uh, despite the hints of some in Russia that Russian government would deprive its citizens of freedom to leave Russia, especially since the end of September mobilization. It has not taken. To the contrary, complete and total freedom of movement to anyone who wants to live. We know who is living, generally speaking, and living for good, 
or for a very long time, given the rally. Why do you think Putin and his cronies allow such a drain of educated, experienced brains, thinkers, business people? Um, well, I think I think there's some simple cost and benefit analysis. I actually think this is a perfectly rational uh, set of behaviors um, to, <clears throat> uh, and you know that. Uh, it's kind of like a larger version of what uh, of, of the Soviet model, which was to shut most people in the country, but force the troublemakers out of the country. There are a lot more troublemakers in Russia today than there were in the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. So uh, a rational way of handling this is to create the specter of closing borders to speed up the process of potential troublemakers leaving the country, right? Uh, Putin's fear of protest matches his fear of assassination. He is just as disproportionately afraid of, um, of, of, of street activity as he is disproportionately afraid of, um, of, of you know, betrayal and, and, uh, and attack. And so he really does want those people out. Um, so, you know, they strategically uh, at a certain point closed uh, the borders to exit by people of dra uh, men of draft age, uh, or not all of them, but you know, some number of them. Uh, it's been a mess. I'm sure restrictions are going to uh, uh, to slowly escalate. Are they going to actually close the border completely? I don't, you know, I don't know that it's necessary, right? They might at, at some point close the border to all men, right? Um, but continue to to allow people whom they want to leave the country to leave the country. It may become a more sort of personalized uh, process, but it, it does make perfect sense to me. And and also continuing to fan the fears of closing the border so that people do leave also makes sense. Um, you know, how does it? Um, why do they allow the brain drain? Because it's you know it's it, it, it's it doesn't brain drain doesn't threaten the regime protesters and putin's ima imagination threaten the regime so you uh, you said before that vladimir putin kind of justifies this by already thinking that he's at war with nato uh in the west is that getting intensified when western leaders keep like drawing red lines and then crossing them like joe biden recently uh, said that they were going to send tanks to Ukraine. Before that, he said that they would never send tanks to Ukraine because that would mean the start of World War III. So by Western leaders, like actions not matching their statements, does that give Putin more uh, fuel to you know, make more propaganda and kind of justify his own thoughts? Well, the thing about propaganda is that it doesn't need fuel. Uh, so no. <laughs> Um, so there has been a lot of discourse more recently on decolonization, both within Russia and in the former post-Soviet bloc. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see any future in that? And what does that mean to you? Um, I mean, I think that is the future, right? Where um, I, I said earlier that Russia is not going to move on from this, uh, you know, fundamentally imperial superpower obsession with the great patriotic war until there's a, another story. That story would have to be post-colonial. Is it going to be uh, post-imperial, uh, right? Uh, is that a story that we're going to see in our lifetimes? I don't know. Well, many thanks to both for the conversation. And uh, I have two short questions and uh, you just want what you want to refer to, if any. <laughs> So the first one is about nature of fear and the obvious parallels with the Cold War, because that time it was just generation experience, generation it shaped the generation. And do, do you think it's it's possible now? So because Putin clearly wants to produce uh, fear, and uh, but it's not maybe it's limited. Well, at least there is nothing like that trending on TikTok. If you measure it like this. Uh, so of course, I, I think I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the like, fear uh, of nuclear war, or yeah, mm -hmm. uh, now and uh, um, in the the era of Cold War, mm -hmm. and uh, the second question was about um, 
uh, I really liked your phrasing about like, um, not to support the war, but oppose the war. So what does it mean for you? And uh, how, what would be the definition of oppose the war from Russia? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, is, is um, if, you're, if I understand your question correctly, is, is, is Putin trying to recreate sort of the, uh, the permanent standoff of, World War, of the Cold War by fomenting fear? of uh, nuclear weapons um yes i don't i mean i don't think it's sort of uh it's not that he has set out to create this it's that that's the universe that he lives in right so he he's using the uh the force of his military and the force of his giant bullhorn to um to project this image of how the world works in his mind it works exactly the same way as it, as it worked during the Cold War. Um, so, uh, what's the difference between opposing the war and and, uh, and not supporting it, it, the war? Uh, well, I mean, it's the difference is I think in um, formulating an opinion. Right? Um, the you know, I think one of Hannah Arendt's greatest insights into the the. the the nature of totalitarianism was that it doesn't, unlike sort of your uh, earlier varieties of tyranny, it doesn't just demand certain behaviors uh, or statements from people, it deprives them of the ability, the ability to form their own opinions, right? Um, so um, in a totalitarian society where propaganda controls everything, sort of the default position is passive support of, of, of the war. Um, if you ask people if they support the war, they will, you know, I mean, you can't even really ask. So uh, what am I saying? But, um, but that's why I think it's meaningful to say that people don't oppose the war because to oppose the war would be to take mental action, at least mental action, right? From which some kind of other action may then uh, proceed. But that's, that's, that's an incredibly difficult, psychically very costly uh, enterprise in a totalitarian society. And, and if, you, if you're asking about sort of what forms it takes, um, there's, um, there's a conversation that an acquaintance of mine recounted to me. Um, she is a Russian journalist in exile. Um, and she talks to her mother and uh, and at one point she told me that, you know, her mother is sort of the perfect totalitarian subject. Uh, and, uh, and she said that her, uh, that at one point she said to her mother something about the war and, um, and the mother uh, said, well, what are you talking about? And, uh, and, and, and the journalist said, well, there's a war going on. Russia is waging war in Ukraine. And the mother said, you say such frightening things. Strashne vesche gavarish dochka. Right, uh, and that to me is the like the perfect encapsulation. Right, the idea is is, is is terrifying. Is this a supporter of the war? Well, I mean, she doesn't even necessarily live in a mental universe in which the war exists. Right, but she certainly doesn't oppose the war. Uh, uh, George Pagler, does Putin know that even limited nuclear war is likely the end of modern civilization? I don't know that. Does he know that? Uh, <laughs> you spoke to him, you know. Uh, yeah, you know we didn't him. discuss this subject. I, you know, I don't know that that's a true statement, actually. Okay. No, I mean, I, you know, it's not evident to me. Maybe it's true, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is about sanctions and. I think you're absolutely right about the effect of sanctions um, mobilizing society um, and, and creating cohesion. Um, but I think that there is a sort of dimin diminishing marginal return around that. When sanctions become truly devastating, um, they can cease to have that effect. So perhaps this is partly asking you know, what the Western strategic objective is with sanctions on Russia? Are they not applying the truly 
suffocating sanctions, it would then kind of move past the unifying effect and be devastating and push more people to leave or uh, foment some dissent. Um, and uh, I sort of speak based on the Iran example, because I think we've reached that point in Iran where sanctions are um, part of uh, the you know, or fueling dissent. So, and if you'll allow me the second question, and forgive me if this is quite naive, um, but uh, given the sort of opposition to, to Russia in the world strategically, um, is there not the sort of counter propaganda being beamed in that would provide the other narrative? Um, because my ants um, are all brainwashed right now. My Iranians are all brainwashed by the propaganda that the Saudis produce and that um, that the opponents of Iran produce. So, you know, that's a society where the opponents of the regime are leveraging propaganda really effectively to counter uh, the regime's narrative of the world. So like sanctions and, you know, where is the opposite propaganda universe that you would think strategically would be being applied to Russian society. Um, that's a, that's such an interesting question about Iran because, uh, of course, my Iranian friends uh, have consistently been opposed to sanctions, uh, you know, and have used the argument that um, uh, that sanctions affect, you know, just make ordinary people miserable and don't actually weaken the regime. Um, I will check back in with them. Uh, I think, you know, they believe that. Uh, that it's actually the pressure from the regime that has finally uh, caused the sort of the, the bubble to burst and and people to protest, and that sanctions um, did nothing to to speed it up. Um, I, I'm just you know uh, I'm quoting that not to get into an argument about Iran about which I know nothing, but to say that that logic makes a lot of sense to me, right? So uh, I think that what what we see in Russia is uh, sanctions do affect, uh, this time around certainly, do affect ordinary people um, um, on a large scale and sometimes in absolutely devastating ways. Um, for example, by cutting off supplies of life-saving medicine, right? um, which I think is, you know, that's, that's a perfectly familiar also thing from Iran. Um, and they do not affect the lifeblood of the regime in any meaningful way. Because uh, in fact, with sort of uh, falling consumer power, the regime has greater export surplus than it's ever had. Right? Um, and, um, uh, and so, you know, the, uh, I think that, the, uh, and I'm not exactly arguing against sanctions, right? I think there's there can be valid arguments for sanctions. It's just none of them are the arguments that at least the U.S. foreign policy establishment has used, right? The logic that the that the establishment has, has used is if we make ordinary people miserable enough, they will come out in droves. That's not happened. That's not going to happen. Um, because the you know it requires uh, a an understanding that uh, that it's the regime's actions that have brought these sanctions onto people. Propaganda has dealt with that very effectively, right? They are unfair to us. They're imposing these sanctions. They're making us miserable. You can feel it on your own skin, right? And um, and it's unfair. And it is unfair. It feels unfair, right? Um, the other thing that it would require would be of people who have been immiserated by you know, economic pressure, uh, have been made consistently anxious by an ongoing war and, and by economic pressure. It would require them to change their worldview and to, and to coalesce and to form bonds of solidarity and to overcome fear, which is something that people under great pressure and in the state of great anxiety are generally not capable of doing, right? Um, so the other story that we hear about sanctions is that the elites will revolt and, um, and the rebel palace group. And I think that that fundamentally misrepresents uh, the nature of the regime. The regime is centered around one person who controls and distributes money and power. So if you just visualize that, right? Like somebody in the middle and everybody in their rays going out to, to everybody, 
what happens when the pie that he is distributing gets smaller is that people are scrambling to get to the middle of the pie to get a bigger share of the smaller pie, right? They're not, again, they're not forming bonds of solidarity, solidarity with one another. And that's why, I mean, I think the information that we're getting at this point from inside the elites is hugely imperfect. Uh, but, but some of the information that's coming is about how uh, the elites are coalescing around Putin. And I think that uh, it's probably an overgeneralization, but it reflects that dynamic of like trying to get closer to him. But I, I also, I, would, I know you've argued for sanctions in the past, so I'd love to hear you talk about this. No, listen, I don't really want to, uh, to divert the attention from you, but I, the point is very simple. You know, we have data. With respect to Iran, we know that by 2012, inflation reached 43 percent. That's few protests. You know, there were so-called chicken protests in in Iran, after which uh, you know the regime agreed to stop uh, the that you know this enrichment of uranium. When you know they started, you know, uh, Iranian leadership started, you know, talking about you know. Uh, that they're going to stop what they're doing and, and blah, 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 blah. So in fact, you know, the uh, sanctions did have impact in Iran. Uh, however, you know, they were much more effective uh, than in Russia because the sanctions were uh, brought uh, against, you know, all Iranian banks. They don't have central bank, but, you know, the all the major Iranian banks. And also there was embargo on, on Iran uh, oil. What happened right. in Russian case, and that is difficult to understand the stupidity of those who uh, imposed those uh, sanctions, that even though they impose sanctions, by the way, there are no sanctions with respect to medicine. And there are, it's true, there is a list of 80 uh, medicine now which are not available that are substitutes. But I just today spoke to somebody in the field and they said, you know, uh, they, uh, uh, they are resolving this problem. They will resolve this problem with medicine uh, in, in Russia. Mm, no, but you know, it's, it's uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so the point is that what happened in Russia, that they imposed sanctions, all kinds of uh, sanctions. Some of them were extremely uh, important. That's why, you know, elites are just devastated by what happened to them because they lost access to their savings and to uh, their real estate in the West. That's the most important part, that they never expected themselves to live inside the cell by the name Russian Federation. You know, they love it to death, but outside they prefer, you know, to do it. Yeah. So uh, therefore, but for some reasons, sanctions were not imposed on oil. So as a result, oil prices went up, gas prices went up, and, you know, Putin was getting, you know, billions of dollars each day uh, from uh, or, uh, oil uh, uh, from a sale of oil. And of course, you know, even though, you know, he sells now to China, China buys uh, Russian oil at the, um, 30 bucks per barrel. It's uh, three times less the market price. So, you know, about that. But still, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's great. So now, you know, now there is embargo on oil, you know, beginning February 5th, you know, the embargo on, on uh, on oil uh, sold via tanks and et cetera, et cetera. We will see the outcome. Now, uh, Putin had a couple of weeks ago, a special meeting with, uh, with businessmen and with his uh, technocrats who are running economy on a daily basis. And, and he put it, uh, 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 he said that the, the, the uh, shops should be groceries, should be available, you know, everywhere. And regardless of the, what they call cheese is not cheese, it doesn't matter, it should be on the shelves, right? Makes out of, you know, cheap, palm oil muscle. So I don't know the English for that. Anyway, palm oil, right. So he said groceries, medicine and cars, because Putin is that afraid that Putin, people in Russia will recall the way it was in the last year's Soviet times when there was nothing available. No food, no commodities, no anything. So they are trying to deal with that. And of course, you know, there are people, businessmen in Russia who are taking advantage of the current situation. And, you know, if Russians know how to do well, that's to go out around 
any laws, borders, and etc. And you know, so they're good at that. Yeah. Um, I just realized there was a second part to your question, <clears throat> and um, and uh, but but also I wanted to add something to the sanctions thing. Uh, you know, a lot of what we think of as sanctions was a kind of uh, spontaneous economic boycott. Uh, imposed by large multinational uh, companies that weren't actually obligated to do this by sanctions. And, you know, and some of it is absurd, right? Uh, I just got a note from, a, uh, and this goes to your second question, I just got a note from an acquaintance who's a writer who wrote a book that, um, that, uh, that, that, that is, uh, it's a wonderful book about uh, the Stalin era, uh, very accessible, very critical. And, um, the book was translated into Russian. The, uh, the, the book is out of print in Russian, but the publisher wants to put it out again. The publisher who is out, outside the country, the writer is outside the country, and Macmillan will not allow the publisher to put it out again because Macmillan will not deal with Russia. So this writer has to buy the rights to his own book from Macmillan and then to allow the Russian publisher to put out a book that is critical of the Soviet regime, right? So, um, and, and you know, none of, uh, not all of it raises to this level of absurdity, but that, that's a lot of how um, uh, sanctions and economic boycotts are just crude, blood, blunt instruments um, that we don't wield very well. Um, now, in terms of being piped, I'm assuming that um, when you're saying that uh, th that uh, sort of counter propaganda is being piped in, it's being piped in through some sort of push media like radio or television, um, right? So the problem with uh, uh, with Russia is that it's a very large country, <laughs> and uh, and you can't just like send satellite signal um, in. There's uh, there's certainly some really terrific journalism, like some of the best that's that's been produced in the Russian language being produced by Russian journalists um, in exile, uh, working from Riga, working from Amsterdam, working from Tbilisi. Um, a lot of their, their media are all blocked in Russia. Some of that content is available on YouTube, which is probably the main avenue. Uh, but YouTube is not a push media, right? It's, uh, you don't, get to watch something on YouTube by accident. Uh, you kind of have to, uh, to know what you're looking for. So it's actually weirdly, uh, although more accessible, much less effective than the shortwave radio of, of, of yore. But, uh, but there's a lot of great journalism being produced by people who don't have access to either side of the war, right? I mean, it's, it's really, it's incredibly inventive and, and absolutely just heroic. Yes, please, Josh. <laughs> Masha, thank you so much for everything today. This has been a fascinating uh, discussion. I want to just push you a little bit on these last two issues. So you make very convincing arguments, both about why the masses are not uh, pushing back, as well as you know why elites haven't done anything yet. But what I'd, I would love to get your take on is one thing on the mass side that we haven't discussed at all here, which is the issue of body bags and troops coming back dead. Um, because there's a discussion of throwing bodies at this, and there's been a discussion of domestic politics, but we, I haven't heard those linked. And as an American, thinking back to the Vietnam War, right? I think that there are a bunch of things that helped turn change public opinion around that, but that was part of it, right? The images of the body bag and just middle-class Americans losing their children you know, in, the, in these wars. And so I guess part of my question is, is there a fundamental difference in the cost of body, of, of, of children, of young people dying, of, of older people dying in a totalitarian or an authoritarian or competitive, whatever we want to call it, authoritarian society? Is that somehow different from an open society? Is the difference that there's no CBS news showing the body bags coming off the planes? But at the end of the day, you can't, there's a limit. I mean, my suspicion is there's a limit to propaganda. When people's children don't come home, it's hard to convince them that there's not a war going on. Like people are going off and they're dying. Right. And then the second part of the question that I wanted to ask is at the elite level, right? Like 
is because I, you know, Jenny and I have talked about this a lot and Jenny's point about all these things that are being taken away from the elites. We have lots of theories in political science around this idea of, of the dangers of alienating elites and elites, you know, bringing, you know, bringing change to the country. Do you see a breaking point for elites? Or is that really just off the table? This is not something that's ever going to happen. Or is there something, I mean, maybe this goes back to the, did you bring out the big sanctions? But is there at some point where the elites are going to actually, you know, move against Putin? And what would what would that look like? Would it be to go back to the beginning of the discussion that he tries to use a nuclear weapon, generals stop him from doing it? Is that a breaking point? Is there something of you know, a certain point over time where it really becomes apparent you're never going to get to the south of France again, you're, you're never going to get back to your yacht. Like, is it so I understand why you think it's unlikely, but is could you tell us, is there a point where you see something that would cause it to go, that would cause that to change? Um, okay, so if I, if I forget the second question again, remind me, but let me start with the first. Uh, the, so I think you said the key words, right? Uh, the image of body bags. Uh, I think, generally speaking, probably not always, right? But to to have protest, especially in a large uh, country, um, where a lot of the you know a lot of these experiences are on the one hand localized, but uh, you know, so there are places like Dagestan or Buretia where a lot of people have been drafted and a lot of people have been killed. But you know, are people able to generalize? beyond their street, beyond their town, when there's no media that they see this reflected in. And what happens to the sort of, to, to the individual experience when there's no reflection of it? Like, is it actually possible? And I think we're seeing, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to ponder, but we are seeing how people are, um, you know, uh, are, are ready sometimes to deny the reality of their own experience because television tells them that it's not so. I mean, they have given up on the idea that there's no war. There's definitely a war now, right? Um, and so <clears throat> that gives grieving families an explanation for, uh, for why their children are, are getting killed. But to have a narrative about an unjustified war and mass deaths and um, you know and and mass deaths for nothing requires some level of communication and some kind of reflection in, in the media right um, and wait there's something else I was going to say oh about the cost of, of human life I mean we know that the regime doesn't value human life right um, but we also know something about uh, and and I try to be much more careful with this because uh, you know, this is not some sort of essential statement on Russian culture, but there, uh, there's some great work by, by Nick Eberstadt on, um, on Russian excess mortality, right? Who, uh, and he basically sort of pioneered this idea of, of deaths of despair before we started using that um, term here. Um, and one of the things that, that he looked at is that, uh, you know, life expectancy for, um, <clears throat> for an uneducated young uh, man in Russia is roughly the same as for an African country at war. Right? So the expectation is that something horrible will bef befall you, right? And and he argues that there's actually a, a rational uh, sort of self-perpetuating mechanism behind this because if your life expectancy is, you know, 34 and um, then of course you're going to engage in all kinds of risky behaviors like uh, drinking, driving, um, drinking potentially poisonous things, which will kill you, which will reinforce this expectation of a short life expectancy. Um, you know, we can't imagine that that doesn't play a role. Of course it does, right? Like life is dangerous. It is inherently sort of un unstable uh, and people die. And people have been dying all around you even before your son was, was drafted. Um, and it helps to sort of diminish that's that sense of protest, um, which uh, you know I think is 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 part of the wisdom of drawing from very economically depressed regions um, where where this is more true. So for the elites, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm an observer, and I'd love to hear, hear Zhenya's take on it. Um, I mean, I 
think there probably is a breaking point, but I think it's very hard to, pr to predict what it is. Um, I think there also has to be some uh, positive incentive, right? So what happens to you? I mean, we know what happens to you if you break with Putin and he uses nuclear weapons and you're prosecuted as a war criminal. And there's like no positive incentive for, for uh, uh, resisting any of this. Um, what, what vision of a personal or collective future can Russian elites have that will help them act against Putin? I, you know, that's, that probably requires some really fine work on, on, on the part of Western intelligence services. Anyone, you know, we have to uh, round up, yes? Okay, yes, please. Might be a little bit of a tricky question, and the question is: Was the war avoidable? Um, and the reason it could be a tricky question has two parts. One is an internal part, whether um, it's really just Putin's fault, and it's really easy, I guess, to blame on one individual, or there is a context of history, and we're watching, you know, Bal Balabanov's movies in the '90s, and there is this kind of imperial mindset of the country. And the the other part of the question is external, whether the West, even listening to the 2008 Putin speech um, at the convention, um, might have misread or mistakenly under understood his future potential actions and if something could be done externally as well. Thank you. Have I mentioned that I'm a journalist and uh, <laughs> which is like this and uh, you know in answering this question is even worse than being a historian uh, because I mean you know we know what happens. Um, I think I think I would be hard pressed to make the argument that it was avoidable because we don't know if it was avoidable, right? Um, I think you're right in pointing to certain contributing factors. Right? Um, so I think we can go back and talk about things that were done wrong or weren't done and should have been done, but I, you know, we have no basis, and we will never have any basis for saying that the war was avoidable. May I ask you one quick question? Nice. You wrote a book about the guy. You uh, you met the guy, unlike uh, 99, 19 percent, right? So you spoke to him face to face. How was it possible that he, that Putin so miscalculated everything? You know, he was the guy who had access to information. Yes, you would tell me. You know, yes. Uh, that you know, loyalty in exchange for uh, for expertise. But you know, still, it's very strange. He's a KGB guy. Corporation is in power. He has you know, he has you know, possibility to to get the information what you know, uh, Trump ate for breakfast and what he's planning to eat for dinner. Now, how did he miscalculate so bad? That's... And what happened with Ukraine? Also, you know, it's another related <laughs> question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what happened? What do you mean? What happened with Ukraine? Why? Well, also, what did every each and every you know? I spoke to the majority of military analysts before the war. The best here in the United States kept telling me, "Genia, Ukrainians will be able to sustain, you know, to resist for three days, maybe three weeks. That's it." The miscalculation on both sides immense. There was overestimation of the power of the second army in the world, Russian, and there was definitely underestimation of the ability of Ukrainians to resist. Why? Um, so, uh, my, you know, the story of my meeting Putin is my best cocktail party story to make it. <laughs> To make it brief, uh, and this is the relevant part, right? Um, so Putin knew that uh, he liked this magazine, the uh, popular science magazine. I mean, the whole thing is like a joke, right? It's, except that, uh, except that it's not. Uh, it was a popular science magazine. He was he was going hand gliding with the Siberian cranes. He wanted 
a report in the magazine about his hang gliding with the Siberian cranes. I didn't want to send a reporter, not because I wanted to resist Putin, but because I thought, well, if I send a reporter, we're, you know, something's gonna, like a crane is going to die for sure. Uh, and uh, uh, well, because you know they had like drugged the leopard and uh, and, and uh, subdued the polar bear. I mean, this was like when he was being king of the jungle that year. Uh, things <laughs> kept happening, and um, so you know, uh, and then I'm going to like put in the story about how the crane died, and then they're going to shut down the magazine. So can we just be a popular science magazine and not do this? Um, and so, so that was my, you know, great act of resistance um, for Julius. I was sorry, but the 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 prehistory of this was that Putin had um, declared uh, this association with the magazine, and a month after that happened, uh, someone I know was seated next to his press secretary Dmitry Peskov, and uh, and said, "Do you know who the editor of Vakruk Sveta is?" And Piskov was like, no, I have no idea. And she said, well, it's Masha Gessen. And Piskov, according to her, just kind of blanched and said, you know, you've got to be kidding. Um, but she had brought <laughs> this very large magazine in her purse uh, and took it out and said, see, the master. Right? And he was horrified. So this was, um, um, this is on the quality of information gathering in the Kremlin in 2012. I mean, you would think it's not very important, right? Uh, but it is very important if the president is actually going to publicly say that he is entering into a partnership, right? So then three months go by and I get fired and, um, and then he calls me and says, can we, can we talk? And then there's a mad scramble that uh, I could observe from the sidelines inside the Kremlin to be the organizers of the meeting between the administration and the press service. But neither of them, Ultimately, the press service wins, but neither of them informs him, uh, gives him a bio, right? So the first thing he says to me when I walk in is, um, did you like your job or are you trying to create a reputation for yourself as an opposition journalist? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I was like, I don't need to um, create a reputation for myself as an opposition journalist. I had already written the book. The book had been translated into more than 20 languages. It had a combined press run of like over a million. Men without a face. Yeah. Um, no one told him. Uh, <laughs> because he'd already called me on the phone, right? So um, this is not just entertaining, but it is informative because um, what had been happening over uh, the course of the preceding, I can't remember when they did, they start beefing, really, really beefing up the military budget uh, was like in 2008? To, to after 2008. Right, after 2008. Yes, when he became right. a prime minister. Right, and so then, you know, then there was a lot of this reporting upstairs about great advances in the military and how mighty it was and this supersonic missile and this, you know, thing that the Americans didn't have. Um, and that's the information he had. Um, and that's the only information he could possibly have, both because nobody's giving him bad news, but also, of course, because of corruption, right? because there are these vast amounts of money that are being poured into the military. Uh, it's all disappearing, uh, mostly because of corruption. And, um, and how is he supposed to know about this? What, Navalny is going to tell him? You know, um, so, so that, that's the answer to part one of your question. And the answer to part two is because Ukraine is the opposite. Because Ukraine completely reformed its military after 2013. Right? Um, because Ukraine, you know, the, uh, brought in NATO, basically brought, it's, it was probably the only military in the world that was really and truly up to NATO standards because that, they needed to be, because they were trying to join NATO. Um, and, and also because they had women in charge of, the, uh, of bringing it up to, to NATO standards. But, um, but you know, and why did, why did experts get it wrong? Um, because I think expertise is generally slow. I think the period of, uh, you know, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't even mean it in a derogatory way, but the, the period between 2014 and 2022 is, you know, a blink in expert time. Um, and I think, you know, I think it was, it was really, you know, profoundly behind 
the actual facts on the ground. We, we do remember 2014. Right. And, and there, know, was, there was no army. Yeah. There was no army. Yeah. And we also remember that, you know, when uh, Saakashvili in Georgia also was trading with the army, and there was a lot of talks that, you know, Georgia created the absolutely new army. And then, you know, when Russians, when uh, Putin invaded Georgia, you know, it took him three days yeah. to destroy it. Anyway, I think, you know, uh, we have to, you know, to uh, to round up it. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. Let's thank Marsha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you know, on January twenty third, uh, right, you know, uh, before the anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, we we in the Jordan Center were going to have. Uh, Andrew Kramer, the New York Times bureau chief out of Kiev, and uh, Joshua Yaffa, the Marshall's colleague, uh, he's also with the New Yorker. He's probably will be out of Odessa. So we're going to have them on Zoom, but you know, we have, you know, uh, please come and ask them questions so that we are going to discuss, you know, what happened during this year of this awful war that changed the world. February, yes, I'm saying uh, February. And March, on March the 2nd, we are going to have an Apple Bowl uh, in person here in Jordan Center. So also, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, all this European politics, NATO, Poland, uh, Ukrainian, of course. Marsha, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. This was really Thanks. fun. Thank you. Thank you.